Thanks for coming along tonight where we have uh, Aaron Patrick makes a welcome return to the Sydney Institute uh, on the occasion of the publication of his book Ego, Malcolm Turnbull and the Liberal Party's Civil War which is recently being published. Uh, I'll introduce our speaker very briefly. He's well known, senior correspondent at the Finan Australian Financial Review based in Sydney, a former business writer for the Wall Street Journal, covered Australia for the Washington Post for seven years and has been an op-ed contributor to the New York Times. He's the author of three books, two of them I think you spoke here on, uh, Downfall, Credit & Co and The Surprise Party after the 2019 election and now after the 2022 election, Ego, Malcolm Turnbull and the Liberal Party Civil War. Aaron Patrick, you're very welcome. Thank you. Thanks, Jared. It's a real pleasure to be back here at the Sydney Institute. And thank you, everyone, who came along tonight to listen to me um, speak about my my new book. I really appreciate it. And I'm looking forward to having an interesting discussion this evening. Um, I, look, I started off the book in 2021 um, at the Sydney lockdown when I was locked at home like most of us, really bored, and I needed something extra to do. So I thought, well, I'd write a book about the Morrison government. Um, and as I was working th working through this, I thought, well, maybe um, the Morrison government isn't interesting enough. So I thought, maybe I'll do one. Maybe I'll do a comparison book about Malcolm Turnbull and Scott Morrison as prime minister. And so I started researching their family backgrounds, and I discovered that um, Scott Morrison's father had been the mayor had been the mayor of Waverley and had been on the Waverley Council for fifteen years was an aspect that I didn't realise, and I thought, gee, this must have had some influence on Scott Morrison's background, on, on his personality, his interest in politics, and of course, Malcolm Turnbull's background was all very well known to everyone. And then I concluded that Malcolm, Scott Morrison wasn't interesting enough to base a whole book on. And so I thought, wow, well, I'll do a book about Malcolm Turnbull's relationship with the Morrison government. And I thought, because he, he's been pretty aggressive in his public commentary about it. So the more I looked into it, the more links I found between Malcolm Turnbull and some of the sort of protagonists um, during the Morrison government. And then I started to think, wow, there's something in this. This, is, this could actually work together as a book. And as I was writing throughout 2021, I started to become scared that Malcolm Turnbull would stop criticising the Morrison <laughs> government. <laughs> Fortunately, my fear was misplaced. <laughs> um, then people, the main question I get asked about Malcolm is, did he speak to you? And um, I say, well, he did, but they weren't, they weren't like a meeting of the minds. I was in a bicycle shop in town at, in January this year, trying to pick up my bike, which I had smashed in the top of my garage, so I drove in with it on the top of my car. And um, I got a call from Malcolm, and I had sent him one of the chapters, I think that morning, one of the really edgy chapters to ask him to fact check it. And um, I swear, within an hour of receiving it, he, it must have been within an hour, he called me back. He called me, and we had a conversation. He said, Aaron, I'm not going to be your editor. And I thought, oh, that's a that's a fair comment. And he said, look, I'm not going to talk to you. I said, well, that's your prerogative. And then the men in the bicycle shop couldn't understand why this tall bloke was sitting there on the phone, would not get off the phone for almost an hour. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, when am I going to be able to try and get my bicycle because I can't just hang up on Malcolm? Um, so, look, where does this leave this? The, um, I had the pleasure of reading a review of my book in my what am I published by my own company a couple of weeks ago, which basically ripped it apart and said that I had um, fundamentally misunderstood Malcolm Turnbull's motivation. <laughs> so I thought, you know, it was good of the age to commission a, a, a um, ABC journalist to <laughs> review it. <laughs> but you know. Um, 
Malcolm said to me, I'm not doing this for revenge. I'm doing this to make Australia a better place because I, <laughs> I, will, I have a good understanding of public policy and I'm able to contribute to it. Now, look, that's a legitimate argument and Jonathan Green believes it. Well, good on him. Um, I, I think the evidence bears itself out, but I present the evidence to all of you in the book and make up your own minds and feel free to disagree with me. Um, um, I think... Malcolm Turnbull's behaviour was one of the most remarkable things that I've ever seen in Australian politics. You know, he's not the first Prime Minister to turn on his own party, but he's the, he's the first one, I think, to do it in such an intense and dedicated fashion. And, um, and, and it goes to, I think, an important question of politics and the practice of politics and the practice of leadership and which is, do we owe our, our, our organisations which help create us a form of institutional loyalty? And um, even when they turn on us, even when they humiliate us and remove us from power. And um, for me, I think it's, a, it's an important question which goes to our judgement of Malcolm Turnbull as a man. And I think you can separate the man or woman um, from their actions or how they lead. And I think in Malcolm's case, um, he, he, we're entitled to judge him for his post-political behaviour, particularly when we've got plenty of other um, examples to compare him to. Um, anyway, look, it makes for, it makes for great material. Um, and I, uh, when I was when I finished the book and I was in discussions with the publisher about when we'd publish it, they told me that they couldn't publish it before the election, um, and I was insistent that they did because I felt that um, uh, I got in, I got it done by the deadline, and that um, Australians would would be interested, clearly, clearly Australians were interested, engaged in politics during the election. But I was told that the um, publisher was, was, had a much bigger, more important book to publish, which is getting precedence over mine, which was Sam Maiden's book about the treatment of women under the Morrison government, and which I expected to make an appearance. Um, and so I had to bow to, bow to, bow to Sam's um, priority, Sam being a priority, because. I think you know she's much better known than I am, and I knew that her book, um, when it comes out, I, I presume when her book comes out, would sell extremely well, um, because of tap into the one of the great critiques of the Morrison government, which is that um, it, it didn't understand women. Um, so it turned out Sam didn't get a book in, done in time, um, <laughs> and and that and it's not easy to do so. So I don't criticise her for that. Um, and my book was published after the election anyway, and, I, and it turns out that I was entirely wrong, that that was the appropriate time for it to be published, because in a way, in a way that I didn't entirely foresee, it, it explained, I would suggest, why Scott, one of, one of the reasons, or some of the reasons, that the Liberal Party lost the election, which is um, that Malcolm Turnbull and others um, helped create very successfully an image of Scott Morrison um, that we all understand, okay, and that, that a lot of Australians, Australian women, rejected. Now, I think um, Scott Morrison was not as bad a Prime Minister um, as the election result would suggest. Um, he clearly, clearly wasn't wasn't perfect, um, but I, I, I did not feel that he deserved to be criticised for his religious beliefs. Um, I'm no Pentecostal, but I don't see any reason why that faith should really um, impact a person's ability to be a great leader. Um, I think um, Scott Morrison's, the government's um, shepherding of Australia through the pandemic was strong. 
Mm. And, I, and I think on an any objective basis, they, um, they managed that with competence. Um, but Australians were tired and they didn't particularly mm. like the Prime Minister. And so in their infinite wisdom, we have to, we obviously, obviously we have to respect that and respect and try and understand their judgment. Um, and, um, and I think, I presume Malcolm was pretty pleased with the result too, because I think he would have seen it as a vindication of himself. <coughs> and, um, and I guess I, I feel for him because to have um, a burning sense of betrayal or failure that drives you to, um, to seek potentially revenge on your former colleagues, I think is, it's not the most noble of motivations and um, a very human one, a very human way to behave, but not one that I think is likely to generate happiness, you know, or satisfaction with your life. I'm going to wrap up there um, because I think there's a lot, I get the sense there's a lot we can all talk about, but instead of me just waffling on, I'd really like to hear what you guys would like to discuss, you know, and, and have a conversation about it. Is that okay, Jared? That's fine. Um, that's the shortest speech I've ever had here. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Won't be difficult doing a transcript. Of this. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty postage stamps around. Still, um, <laughs> yeah. So. Um, <laughs> Um, look, I don't usually do this. It's a very unorthodox. Uh, don't worry about it. Leave it there. No, leave it there. No, no. Now we can see it. It's a very unorthodox event tonight, I must say. Um, so I think I should say something in defence of Jonathan Green, who wrote that review. I think you've dismissed him unfairly. He's one of Australia's finest intellectuals. Anyone who, who listens to um, design on ABC Radio National of a Saturday morning at around nine o'clock if you happen to be walking your dog Jackie or someone else's dog. <laughs> or know that one of his most important investigations only halfway through is a discussion about how to cook lamingtons. <laughs> so I don't want you to put anyone off because you're upset about his review that they should not learn from him how to cook lamingtons. <laughs> he being one of the ABC's <coughs> Leading intellectuals. <laughs> He's also the editor of the Engine magazine at Melbourne University. <coughs> I read it once in 1965. <laughs> I wouldn't advise you to read it. No. Um, let's go back to the topic. Um, what I found interesting in your book, and I, I read it in early on, um, was it seemed to me that Malcolm, Malcolm um, Turnbull had a kind of path from his home or by Zoom straight into Radio National Breakfast uh, with interviews, but essentially towards the end with Patricia Cavellis and before that with Fran Kelly and they, they changed over. And you also mentioned in your book and the most extraordinary allegation was about the case of Kate. When Mr Turnbull seemed to say on, suggest on about three occasions without being picked up that Kate may not have committed suicide, that in fact she might have died through other means. So what was that kind of relationship between Malcolm Turnbull and Patricia Cavallis that led to those kind of comments you could make in a seven, eight, nine, ten minute interview in prime time and sort of get away with it? Well, Jared, straight to the heart of the matter. <laughs> Thank you very much for that. Um, look, you know, you are, you, you, you're raising, you, you are in your specific question about Catherine Thornton, Christian Porter's accuser, and, and Malcolm Turnbull's comments upon that, about that, you are alluding to um, a cause which is very close to your heart and a lot of other conservatives, which is the allegations of institutional bias within the ABC. And it's a, it's a, it's a very, very fraught and dangerous topic for those of us in the media um, to engage it. And I have been, um, you know, partially cancelled by the ABC um, for a number of years now um, for exactly what I, I don't know for certain. Um, but um, 
and and I find that um, that I'm not um, I, I'm wary of uh, of using platforms like this to to attack or condemn the ABC. Um, in part because I think it does a lot of good in some ways um, and in the ways in which it behaves unfairly I think they're, they are very well um, I think they are thoroughly thoroughly described in the conservative press um, I remember living in the UK where I covered the media and I covered the BBC and the BBC, while attracting similar criticism, did seem to be, I think, more effective at um, presenting a broader spectrum of arguments. And I formed a view that that was because, partly because of the funding mechanism, because of the direct relationship between the people who consume the BBC's content and the money that the BBC uh, received. And maybe that's something model that we should one day consider in Australia. Um, in relation to Christian Porter's accuser, you know, for me this is what the accusations made against Christian Porter and the effect they had on him, for me is one of the most remarkable things I've ever seen happen to a politician in public life. Because there was a man who was legitimately seen as a potential a ministerial candidate was entirely destroyed in his reputation by allegations even its most ardent advocates acknowledged could never be proven to be truthful or not. And so um, as a society I think it's worthwhile and that's what I've tried to do in this book even though I was concerned that it would um, cause a lot of blowback towards me, um, examine the facts of the matter and work out as a society what do we do in these situations where people are accused of very serious crimes and in effect there is no way for them to defend themselves. And so um, I have, so I tried very hard to present the, case, the, 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 the circumstances of the case in an objective and fair way. And um, Peter Van Onselen came up to me last week when I was in Canberra and very generously said Aaron Porter wouldn't have liked it and Kate Thornton's people wouldn't have liked it either. So um, well done. And I thought that was a very generous remark for, for, for Peter to make. Um, when I was um, going through the editing process with, the, um, with Harper Collins, when it came to the chapter, there was a moment where um, I was describing Malcolm Turnbull dialing into Fran Kelly um, and um, just after the rape allegation broke. I think it might have been three days afterwards. Um, but at that point, Porter's accuser wasn't known. Sorry, at that point, Porter's identity wasn't known. And it was the great parlour game for anyone interested in politics in Australia to try and work out who it was. And people were actually creating spreadsheets online um, of, of cabinet ministers to try and work out who it was. And, and, and um, Malcolm knew it was because Kate Thornton had contacted him to tell him that um, a porter had allegedly raped her when she was 16 years old. And Malcolm got on the radio and he said it, it said she committed suicide. Well, did she? You know, what, what really happened here? And the implication of what he said was, that, well, if she can commit suicide, was that she was murdered, and um, a, a, and and I just um, I was um, saying that the publisher was saying to me, well, you've put this 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 interview at the start of the chapter, but it doesn't fit chronologically because it's, you know what the, the events in this chapter start with the with um, Kate, Louise Milligan's report, and I said, but we need to emphasise this this very interview to me sums up the entirety of Malcolm Turnbull's behaviour towards the government. And so we need to draw attention to this and explore it and try and understand it and convey to people the significance um, of these comments. And I was literally doing an interview 
half an hour ago with ABC Radio Brisbane drive time and this came up and Steve Austin said to me well but maybe you made too much of this maybe the Prime Minister just maybe Malcolm Turnbull misspoke or it's just a case of rhetorical overreach and I'm like look sure you can make that argument but you know Malcolm Turnbull was a for all his faults was that was this is a skilled orator you know verbal communication is probably Malcolm Turnbull's greatest skill you know and he reveled he reveled in all of these interviews with the ABC. And I don't begrudge the ABC for running him um, because he made great radio and television. Um, but I think also um, the rest of us are entitled to um, judge him by his words. Okay, Aaron, just stay there. So I've got a, just before we go to anything else, I've got a, there's a question. Look, I'll just take this one on and then we'll go here. So I've got a call on. Um, Zoom. Um, this is a question about repeated calls for Mr Turnbull to be expelled from the Liberal Party. Why wasn't he? Well, I guess that's not for you to say, but um, would that be beneficial or would it not be beneficial? Or doesn't it matter? Um, should Malcolm Turnbull be expelled from the Liberal Party? Go to a straw poll and put the hand up if he thinks he should be expelled? Yes. Who cares? Who cares? Who cares? Who cares? <laughs> we, have, we, have, so we, we have Christine Forster down the, down the front row on Zoom. You won't, you won't know. She's a, she, she was a um, um, Sydney City Councillor for the Liberal Party. And, um, and I'm not sure what your position is. Should he be expelled, Christine? Uh, well, he should be, as all members of the Liberal Party should be, subject to due process. The Liberal Party has very strict rules. <laughs> is that a politician's answer? Uh, yeah, politician's answer. I'd recommend that you not ask the audience questions because they provide answers. <laughs> <laughs> so we go here. Very pretty interesting answers. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Look, your book's more than just about Turnbull. It's really about Turnbull's relationship with the media and how the media really has become an active player in modern politics. And you, and I would take it from. And I'm interested in your comment, but I take it that you think that the the media's role in politics now, their activism, is not a good thing for, um, for, for politics. Yeah, look, that, thanks, for that. thanks for the very thoughtful question. I got, got myself in a bit of hot water um, last year when I suggested that a group of um, senior female journalists had become unashamed activists and trying to bring down the Morrison government, and I've never backed away from that assertion, and I don't today. Um, what I didn't mention in the article was is that you know plenty of male journalists have been political activists well before they did. And in a way, I was saying good luck to them for standing up there and pursuing <coughs> the agendas that they felt was important. Um, um, so I think, um, it, look, it is not a simple, it's not a simple issue. Because why we, while we need good objective reporting, um, we also, it would be naive of us to think that journalists who become commentators will not use their, their pens to push for certain outcomes. And in a way, that's what the readers want. And um, unfortunately, it feels harder sometimes to be more in the centre these days, okay? Because we've, we've convinced readers and voters that the other side is so bad, such of such ill will, um, that when you go in the middle and you say no, they're all they're all decent people, mostly decent people trying to get the best outcome they can. Um, a lot of people don't want to hear that, and so you get so you get a lot of pushback. It is much safer to go into a tribe on either the left or the right if you're a media commentator, and that's sort of what I was. What I've sort of been trying to push push against, you know, and I can't I can't criticise other journalists for being opinionated because I, I, I'm I'm in a lot of my writing, and that's what the readers seem to enjoy most. Aaron, can you put it into context a little bit more for us? One of your earlier, when your earlier remarks, you said that um, leaders have in the past uh, <coughs> said negative things about their party after they have lost, but not to the extent that Malcolm Turnbull did. 
Can you can you give a few comparisons? Yeah, of course. There are there are two um, main examples. Um, Malcolm Fraser became um, obviously became went went to the left um, after he was he left office, but not until later in his life. And his public comments. He was not a prolific um, uh, figure in the, in media circles, um, and so. Uh, I think Malcolm, Malcolm Fraser, I think, was the probably the biggest example. But there was also um, uh, um, I have to get this right, or else um, Jer and Nan are going to pull me up on it. But John Gorton, John Gorton fell out badly with the Liberal Party so much so that he ran um, as a Senate candidate in the ACT, and I think he got about 17% of the vote. So these were all in the in in the pre-social media um, era. Um, but neither man had any significant political impact through their differences with the Liberal Party. Okay? And I'm unaware of any examples post-war from the Labor Party. Okay? So in that sense, I would say Malcolm Turnbull, in his relationship with his own political party as a Prime Minister, is unique. Okay, there's a question down the back there. We better wait for the here. microphone. Okay, so here we go. We'll go ahead. Hi, I've Hi. known. Is that on? Here it is. Speaking. I've known Malcolm since he was 15, and I noticed on page 298, uh, you say he wouldn't discuss his childhood. It seems to me the rejection by his mother has led him to feel that the Liberal Party was like his mother and he felt rejected. I, I really think you should follow through his, his life. About uh, thank you very much for your question. I appreciated that. appreciate that. And um, it's, it's great to have someone here who's known Malcolm Turnbull for, for a long time. And, um, and, and I agree with you. I think um, Malcolm Turnbull's family relationship is really important in terms of understanding him. And I know this has been a well-told story, but you know Malcolm Turnbull's mother left when he was ten, and that that decision had a profound impact on his childhood, in that he was he would became a boarder at Sydney Grammar down in Randwick. It was a small boarding house. My sense is it was dominated by tough farmers' kids. You know Malcolm was an intellectual. He was bullied, and um, and I think that that must have created a great sense of betrayal from his mother. At the same time, there's this fascinating sexual puritanism um, in Malcolm's leadership as Prime Minister when he opposed, when he was unhappy with um, his ministers having sex with their advisers. And, um, and, and look, uh, putting aside whether you agree with the policy or not, and I, and I do think there's actually arguments on both sides, um, um, Malcolm Turnbull's mother was, 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 as far as I can tell, what, what they probably would have called a libertine at the time. You know, she married one of her father's friends. He was 30 years older. Within a week of the wedding, he got sick. Within six months, he was dead. And she inherited a lot of money, I think, and some Point Piper apartments. And then went on to, went on to marry two other men. Um, and, um, but, you know, by all accounts, uh, Lansbury, is it Angela Lansbury, um, was, a, was a woman who enjoyed, enjoyed her life, enjoyed, enjoyed her, her sex life, and, um, and, and moved in sort of um, entertainment circles in, in, in inner Sydney. And so, I, you know, I think, I think it's fair to sort of assume that she would have thought that the idea of banning sex in offices, basically between men and younger women, was kind of quaint. <laughs> Angela was the actress. She was an actress on oh, Angela. Angela. It's Coral. Angela it's Coral. Coral. Thank that's you, Chris. Right. Thank Coral. you. Sorry, just Coral. I called her Angela Lansby, but of course that's a television actress. <laughs> it's Coral Lansby. And I think they may have been cousins. Yeah, they were. Yeah. Okay, they were. We're being told. Okay. okay. So many people you speak to talk talk about Malcolm Turnbull as being Labor light. And uh, probably quite a few people in this room might have that sentiment when they are asked to describe him in political terms. Do you think that 
he fits that bill and is he was he always really in the in the wrong party of the two major parties in this country would he would he have been any more of a success in the labor party or would he have just been kevin rudd mark ii well look that that's one of the crucial questions of malcolm turnbull and why he was an unsuccessful liberal leader and i know a lot of conservatives believe that okay and i think that's a very strongly held view amongst conservatives and it's not for me to to say that they're wrong um look i i i see malcolm as i do not see malcolm as a as a labor manchurian candidate you know malcolm grew up in in wentworth um in a capitalist household he was a very successful businessman he was an investment banker he was he wasn't a trade unionist you know he was on he, to my mind he was on the left wing the far left wing of the Liberal Party, which of course, you know, as we know, would make him more left-wing than some Labor MPs, but doesn't make him Labor. Um, but look, I accept that other people with, who understand politics a lot better than me have a different view. But I would see Malcolm as, as a proto-teal, you know? Just picking up that um, answer and that question, Aaron, it's, it might be apocryphal, but it was said that Graham Richardson blocked Malcolm Turnbull's um, attempt to get into the Labor Party, and again, it might be apocryphal, and Jared might know more about this than you do, that John Howard invited him into the Liberal Party, and when he wanted to quit after losing the opposition leadership, he said he should stay. Um, what do you think about those decisions, if true, by those two men, Richardson and Howard? Well, look, I. I I don't know if the Graham Richardson anecdote is true, Stuart. Um, it's a good story. Um, clearly, John Howard played a central role in Malcolm Turnbull's ascension as Liberal Party leader. Um, Malcolm Turnbull promoted, uh, sorry, John Howard promoted Malcolm Turnbull to cabinet um, and convinced him to stay after the Gordon Gretsch affair, and he was considering leaving politics altogether. So in a way, I thought, I, you know, I thought, it's funny because um, Howard is badly disliked on the left, but he sort of had the wisdom to create one of the greatest, you know, quasi left wing figures of the whole coalition and coalition history. You know, Howard, Howard helped sustain and promote the politician who's done almost as much as anyone else, I think, to advance the cause of, um, of climate policy in Australia, whether you like it or not, whether you think it's an overreach or not. And so, um, in a sense, that to me was a sign of um, Howard's, I guess, cleverness. Because I, I, having spoken to Christine Forster's brother about this, who's Tony Abbott, um, I get the sense that he might have preferred that John Howard was more Tony, pro Tony Abbott and less pro Malcolm Turnbull. Anyway, it's like it's a fascinating issue, John Howard's involvement in these two men. Look, I, I wanna, I'll tell a story out of school because, you know, who's listening out there? Not <laughs> <laughs> um, a lot of people, though. <laughs> um, don't put this in media diary. So I was, I, um, I got a, I got a uh, phone call from uh, uh, Janet Alrickson the other day, who wrote a very generous column about ego a couple of weekends ago. And um, she had been to um, a lunch at the Australian Club with Tony Abbott for his birthday. And she gave him a copy of the book. And, um, and, but at the Australian Club, for reasons I don't understand, you're not allowed to put, leave presents on the table while you're having lunch. And so, which was a shame because Malcolm Turnbull walked by in the middle of the lunch. <laughs> Any more questions? <laughs> About the Australian Club. <laughs> You're not allowed to talk business. Yeah, a couple of questions yes, down no, the no, back. No, we're right, no, no, we're running this here. Uh, I just want to <laughs> I'm not trying to take uh, it over. No, you no, mentioned the Teal campaign. And of course, what happened just there could only happen at the Australian Club, of course. <laughs> the Teal campaign, to my mind, didn't just come about spontaneously because a group of single-minded women decided to knock off 
mostly blokes in safe seats, liberal seats. And they had money from Simon Holmes of Court, but it seems to me you touch on it just a little in your book. How much was Malcolm Turnbull involved in it? Because I think it was strategised and there are some connections. Did you come across any further evidence about Malcolm's role in the Teal? Because it's really been very damaging to the Liberal Party. To my mind, it's a bit like the DLP on the Labor Party 50 years ago. It's taken a whole chunk of Liberal territory and they're going to take a long time to get it back. This is the great unknown story of the 22 election, which I could not crack, which was, you know, were the Turnbulls there operating with the Teals behind the scenes? Because if they were, that, that was a big story. And you know, if it was, it would have been through Alex Turnbull, because there was him and Simon Holmes of Court were having interactions on social media, I think, and clearly Alex got burned in the 2019 election, where he came out publicly, you know, urged people to vote against Dave Sharma and Wentworth, was giving money <coughs> to the Teals, and then was getting a lot of negative press coverage about it. Um, but if if the Turnbulls were behind Climate 200, then they've hidden it very well. Um, Jared and Anne had Troy Bramson here a few week, months ago talking about Hawke and Howard and their, their management skills as Prime Ministers. Have you got anything to say about Turnbull's sort of general leadership skills? I think that'd be very interesting. I, I'm always fascinated by how high-level leaders um, operate as managers, and and so I explored this with Malcolm. And what 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 impressed me, and um, about Malcolm Turnbull was, is that even min, even some of the ministers who resigned, um, in in that big, just before he was removed as leader, acknowledged that he he would sometimes or often allow ideas to be contested so you could change his mind you know I know Matt, Matt Canavan mm -hmm. um, speaks quite positively about his management skills and I think Canavan was in cabinet with him at some point yes, he was when Canavan I think was Minister for Northern Australia and he was representing coal interests um, but then, a, but then a, a, another of his ministers I won't quite name them tonight um, they said <laughs> Malcolm enjoyed policy debate so much it hurt the decision making process. So they'd be up there in Canberra, they'd be talking about an issue for three hours and Malcolm would say, this is fantastic. <laughs> Let's come back tomorrow at 7.30 and finish it off. And they're like, no, we just want to go to bed. You know, we just want, let's, let's make the call. Whereas Scott Morrison was completely the opposite. He was a one person, promised who liked making decisions, would make a lot of decisions and um, without a massive amount of cabinet discussion. Mm -hmm. Aaron, con congratulations on the book, a great read for those who haven't read it yet. Um, <coughs> picking up on an earlier question in relation to betrayal, um, if it influenced Malcolm's early part of his life, certainly he reacted with betrayal against the Liberal Party. Um, his reaction to Christian Porter appears to be because of his perception of Christian Porter's betrayal of him during the coup, he then pursued betrayal of Christian Porter and his vindictiveness to Scott Morrison was because he felt betrayal there because he'd promoted Scott. Um, betrayal influences many of his actions and reactions. Do you have any other comment? You've picked it up in the book, um, but do you have any other comment today on the betrayal? About, about the betrayal Malcolm may have felt well, or the one he, he may have wreaked? He, he felt betrayed, but then his natural response to reactions to other people was one of betrayal. Mm -hmm. so it yeah, look, I, I, I imagine that um, Malcolm Turnbull doesn't feel that he has betrayed the Liberal Party. Um, that he feels that he, he's the aggrieved, aggrieved party here and that he is trying to, I guess... Um, Trying that he's acting out of a sort of noble, noble, noble sense of of duty to the country, and 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 like it's not just me who's saying this. You know, this there were senior people from the Howard government went and saw him, and they basically said, "Please shut up." <laughs> and he said, well, "What are you talking about? You know, what are you, what's this base? What's this liberal base you're talking about? You know, 
I'm just out there on ABC just chatting away. I'm not out. I'm not seeking revenge. Um, so it's almost a sort of disassociation between his actions and how he's explaining them, even in private. So I, I know that's not a very good answer to your question, but it's almost... Um, uh, it, it, we almost need Malcolm here tonight to answer that question. Because <laughs> I don't know that anyone else can, him or Lucy. Do you have any, have any more online questions? Yeah. Hi, Aaron. Thanks for the uh, presentation. Malcolm Turnbull was Prime Minister for close on three years, and putting aside his um, antics, you know, post, post Prime Ministership, how do you think he'll be regarded by history as a Prime Minister? I mean, after all, climate issues aside, it was, you know, the, the, the China awakening did kind of happen under his watch as well. Well, thanks. Thank you for the question, Dimitri. I think, look, this is a first draft of history, so um, I, I am, uh, you know, I would, uh, I've written how I think history will, will regard him. Perhaps in the fullness of time, there'll be more fulsome and, and fulsome accounts and analyses of what he did. You know, Malcolm's danger, Malcolm Turnbull's danger is that if he's, if he's perceived to be wreaking personal vengeance against his successes, he will blind, blind history to his achievements, which, which were not nothing, okay? Um, and, um, and so that is a real danger for him. I think his, his, book, his book he wrote was, I thought, it, I think he's a brilliant writer and I really enjoyed his um, biography, but I think it was shameless self-promotion. And um, I don't think that's unusual in ex-politicians. Um, but look, to be honest, Dimitri, I think Malcolm has a bigger agenda, um, which is I think he wants to be president of Australia. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> that's very funny. That's only a half joke. <laughs> And the other half? <laughs> now, there's a question down the back. Before we get to it, oh, I've got one on. Sound engineer wants to ask a question. I've got one on too, but. Oh, sorry, I'm not allowed to. It's going to take me a minute to get. I'm running this year. I know. <laughs> so you can tell me. This is a news call, not a fair fact. should have bought some pizza tonight. <laughs> um, if you were going to go to this in a minute, but if you. Um, your book's just out, but you've been talking to a lot of people. Um, would you change it much already or not? I mean, how, how quickly is this story developing, in other words? Would I, ch would I change the book? In what sense? I mean, Why? Would you make any additions to what you've already said in view of what you've learned since the book's come out? Um, yeah, look, uh, I, I've, I've, learned, I've learned a lot more about um, the Morrison government and how it operated in some surprising ways. But that is going to be the subject of a very long magazine article coming out in a month's time, so I don't want to give, give, give that away. Now, there's a question here on the Zoom. Um, you've, spoke, you've spoken about um, one member of the, of the Turnbull family. What about, the question is about, to what extent do you think Lucy Turnbull had an influence on these events? I think she's mentioned in your book from memory, but probably briefly. She is. Look, uh, I, the remarkable thing about um, about the Turnbulls is that they were, they are, a really powerful, wealthy Sydney family, and they operate like one. You know, this is how this is how power really works in this town. Okay, and they are a tight team, and they're very tight with their children too. And if you fall out with them, they don't they cut you off. And um, it was uh, Russell Pillamar, who was um, a colleague of Malcolm's from Goldman Sachs, who helped Malcolm make a lot of money. And, um, and he fell out with Alex Turnbull over only $6 million. And um, that was it. That was it. You know, this is a guy who would, Malcolm would ring up on New Year's Eve and say, mate, would you mind coming down to Kirribilli? Because we've got a you know party on a party inverted commas, and I need some mates here to fill out the numbers, and Philema would not want to put on a business suit and go down and eat public service food on New Year's Eve, but he would because he was one of Malcolm's oldest.
political business allies and they may never speak again. There's a question down here. On the relationship between Turnbull and Morrison, one of the abiding images that I have of the period that led leading up to his toppling this for the second time was at a press conference and in terms of the relationship between Turnbull and Morrison, some question was put and Morrison, and, and I haven't seen this very often in Australian politics with two lead, leaders at the top of government, or I can't recall it, he put his arm around him and he said, you know, I am ambitious for this man, or words to that effect. I don't know if other people remember it, but I remember it, I'll always remember it. And how much did that, would that incident in itself be enough to continue, you know, in his mind as a reason why, you know, he, he basically has it in for anything Scott Morrison related. Well, <clears throat> fascinating thing about the Malcolm Turnbull Scott Morrison relationship was how far back it went and how much it changed after 2018. And I didn't realise until I started researching the book that Scott Morrison had played what could have been an important but unknown role in Malcolm Turnbull winning the pre-selection for Wentworth. But I think it was 2004, if I remember correctly, and when Scott Morrison was, state di was director of the New South Wales Liberal Party. You know, and really, by, by the people involved, said Scott Morrison put his thumb on the, on the weight in favour of Turnbull in that pre-selection fight with Peter King. And then, um, and then uh, Scott Morrison got promoted very early, very quickly to the front bench after getting the parliament. It might have only been 13 months, I think. You saw then, then, then going forward to 2018, when Scott Morrison said that to Malcolm Turnbull, he endorsed Malcolm Turnbull in front of the whole country, declared his loyalty. Um, Peter Dutton obviously ran against Turnbull. Turnbull in the end decided not to contest. And Scott Morrison, to most people's surprise, became Prime Minister. And, and, and if you listen to Turnbull's language afterwards, it's really conciliatory. He says, he almost says the same thing back. He calls him Scott. And he says, you know, I wish Scott all the best. And um, clearly in his mind, he did not blame Scott Morrison for his downfall. But then media reports started to emerge and uh, was one in the Saturday paper by Karen Milton, I think it was the first one I read, then there were some other ones, saying that Scott Morrison had been playing both sides and he'd, he'd tipped some of the numbers across, some of his centre-right numbers across to, to Dutton, not enough to make Dutton Prime Minister, but enough to destabilise Turnbull. So if that was the case, Scott Morrison had played one of the smartest leadership games in a modern Australian politics, almost certainly in the Liberal Party. I can't, I can't remember anyone who's done anything so clever, and that's really what he did. Um, and then you see, I think, Malcolm Turnbull becoming convinced of this scenario, that's what happened. And so his language towards Morrison changes and becomes more hostile. You know, it becomes Scott Morrison, Mr Morrison, and then in the end it just becomes Morrison. And then the end it just goes out saying, no, he's just a liar, he lies to me. He chases him to Glasgow, he stands up from the world media, he gives interviews to the BBC, saying Scott Morrison's a liar, the Prime Minister of Australia's a, a liar. And, um, and, I, and it, was because I'm, it was because I'm convinced, he became convinced, Scott Morrison was the man, he was the one who was responsible. So when Mr Turnbull wouldn't speak to you, and did for 50 minutes or so, what, what did he say? Um, I think he said something like, I've given enough fucks already um, about this. You know, he was very... Look, he, he said the same things he said in public, but he just swore more. more. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Is there one? Yeah. Right. Um, Let's get in close to the end. Um, Malcolm sort of achieved his goal which is bringing down Scott Morrison. And he's, a he's alleged goal. He yeah, OK, alleged goal, whatever. Um, <laughs> does it go on from here, though? I mean, someone who, to me, has this kind of temperament and modus operandus, I mean, he's not going to be president of Australia because we're not going to get a republic in his lifetime, the way we're going. Um, he, he, and, and he does seem to be energised by his dislike of certain people. 
So what does he do now? Does he destroy the Liberal Party totally? What, what would you say his next move well, will be? That, that's, a, that's a great question. Just on the Republic, I, I, I think the voice, the Indigenous voice, is the first step towards the Republican referendum for the Labor Party. And they'll say, look, we, look at this, we can do constitutional change, it is possible. Um, Republics are going to be a lot harder than the voice. Um, I think for me the key question is what happens to the teal MPs? Do they coalesce into a new centre-right party? So in six years' time, do, we, do they essentially abandon this notion that they are independents and they, um, they all run together? And you can imagine them asking Malcolm Turnbull to join them, you know? the, pres the pres <laughs> President of the Australian Teal Party. <laughs> And, you know, maybe Quite he would. Conceivable. Pardon, Chris? Quite conceivable. Quite conceivable. Yeah. I think it's fair to say, when you were here before the election, you, you did anticipate there'd be a strong vote for the Teals. You probably didn't suggest how many seats they would win, but obviously from the work you were doing then, you thought there was a strong support for them. Uh, did you pick up any influence of Malcolm Turnbull at that time, or was this just general support? I think you spoke about Goldstein and you spoke about North Sydney. Uh, look, to me, Malcolm Turnbull, um, Malcolm Turnbull's values and positions were were um, the way he articulated them and the way he criticised Scott Morrison helped a lot of those affluent liberals. Um, formulate in their mind why they disliked Scott Morrison. So in that sense, I think he was, I, I think his influence is unrecognised, but was, was potent, okay? Um, and I remember staying recently with friends who live in Goldstein in Melbourne, which was Tim Wilson's seat, which was lost to an ABC journalist. And they said, we wanted, you know, these are, these are people who went to private schools, top universities, professional degrees, live in a house with a swimming pool and, and, and have a beach house. And they said, we wanted Tim Wilson to go to Canberra and tell Scott Morrison what was important to us. You know, climate, integrity, you know, gender equality. And essentially, what they were asking was almost beyond the capacity of the political system to deliver. Because they were asking Tim Wilson, who was then a parliamentary secretary, to campaign against the government. And I, I, that was possibly Tim Wilson and the rest of those MPs' only chance, I think, of retaining their seats. Um, but incredibly difficult to expect any human to turn on the institution that gave them their entire career, the whole livelihood, their whole sense of identity, to turn against the people, the people they see in the day-to-day -day life who supported them for those jobs. But that's what the electorates were asking them to do. And, like, and there's only one person I know in the world who'd be capable of doing that, and that's Malcolm Turnbull. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Final question here. Thanks again. My question is, a uh, second question, Scott Morrison, throughout his la last couple of years, um, was subject to many slings and arrows from Malcolm Turnbull and also Kevin Rudd. Why did he never fight back? Why didn't he, if not himself, through you know, delegates or emissaries, fight back? Why did who not fight back? Morrison. Scott Morrison. Scott Morrison. Why did he not go to war with Malcolm Turnbull? Um, because because when you're in a leadership position, you have to be very careful, and you diminish yourself if you fight. And I think. Um, Scott Morrison made a calculated judgment that there was nothing he could do and nothing to be gained from <coughs> fighting Malcolm Turnbull, <coughs> fighting him back. And I don't know if that's true or not. I don't know what the counterfactual is. Um, but it's possible he's right. It's possible that if he had um, if he had done what you're suggesting, that it would have been even worse. Not himself, but through some point of his own. For proxies, yeah, that's a good point. Okay. Many thanks. Well, thanks, for, uh, thanks for the night. We've got copies of Ego, Malcolm Turnbull and the Liberal Party's Civil War, and I'm sure Aaron Patrick will be happy to sign one. 
there'll be, there'll be and I'll be selling copies online later on. But tonight, for an important and entertaining talk by Aaron Patrick. Well Thanks, done. Sir. Good luck. <laughs>